Hello and welcome to Theme Park Worldwide and a bit of a different video here on the channel from Chessington World of Adventures Resort where today I've been invited down by the park to go behind the scenes and also meet some of the creatives behind some of the attractions here at the park. Very excited to go behind the scenes of their new attraction for this year, Room on the Broom, A Magical Journey. Uh, we're going to go through the attraction and see how it was all put together and also see how the controls for all the attraction work. Along with that as well, we'll speak with with both Andy and Michelle a little bit about the attraction how it was put together and also how they got in to the theme park industry and designing these awesome theme park attractions not only that we're also going to head over to the zoo and have a bit of a behind the scenes over there and uh, yeah get to see some different animals and check out some of the VIP experiences that are on offer here at Chessington as well so it's going to be an action-packed video something very different and I must say a big thank you to Chessington uh, for inviting us down today to come and uh, check all of this out um, so yes, without further ado, let's head straight inside Room on the Broom, A Magical Journey, where we're going to be joined by Andy and Michelle, who are going to talk a little bit about the attraction, all the concepts, how it comes together, and of course, how it was built and operates. Right then, so here we are inside the first room. Obviously, this attraction, uh, groups go in. How many in a group can sort of fit through this, and uh, how was the room designed to accommodate the amount of people that are going through? So the maximum number that goes through at any one time is groups of 22, and what the staff will do is they will they will flex that depending on sort of how busy the day is. But that's kind of our maximum capacity, and that's based on um, all of the regulations, the number of people in the building at any one time. Okay, and obviously it's quite a big space in here as well, and there's quite a lot what goes on in terms of uh, with the projections, with the cauldron down there as well. Uh, how do all the effects work and things in here? How is it all put together? So it starts from a creative process where we, we talk with the people that own the intellectual property, Magic Light, mm -hmm. and Julia Donaldson who wrote the story. And the really important thing on any narrative that you do from a theme park experience is to think about how do we get people into the story logically? Mm -hmm. You know, you're going into a book or you're going into a movie and we thought it'd be a wonderful thing to do for the mansion is to make it look like an old library that's magical and that comes to life and tells you a story of room and a broom. We went work with script writers, we work with choreography and we work with animatronic specialists to go, okay, well we want some in a cauldron to explode but we want smoke to come out of it but we need the smoke to linger in the area because when the magical door opens and we've got this gobo light which you can see on the floor working behind me, we want the light beams to come through that but equally we don't want that, that smoke to be in the room for the next people come in so it all comes down to specifying the smoke fluid using water mist and using air and in a moment we'll go and look at that cauldron in more detail. Awesome. I think one of the things we'll do is we'll sit down with all the suppliers, myself and Andy, and we'll go through kind of what is the creative intent and then we'll start discussing different ways to achieve that effect and the best way to do it and what we can do is um, some of the effects around the back and go and have a little peek about how it works and, and see kind of the, the internal workings of it. Awesome. Sounds good to me. Cauldron. Let's go and have a look. <laughs> So the cauldron. There we are. <laughs> Good effects. Oh, I love it. Yeah. yeah. So the cauldron's really important from a show narrative point of view. You just think, oh, just having a large prop in a room. But we had a lot of discussions about how big it is, because this is not the original official scaled one from the book. But when you've got this giant piece here, having a small cauldron wouldn't fill the scene. And then we've got that beautiful bookcase behind you that is that, that makes up part of that narrative too. So the cauldron itself has to have a smoke machine which is hooked up here at the back and at the back just here which then cables through the back and then exit out of this vent here so that's great to do the big effect to fill the room full of smoke and then when we do the animation on the screen we put a bit of smoke coming up in the background with the little magical light that comes out and also when the dragon appears on the book we've got a texture of smoke so those from a projection content point of view and from an effect point of view we are good to begin with We've also got what Andy was saying about the issue with the smoke machine is if we just blast smoke out and we don't have a way of clearing it, the projection doesn't work. Yeah, and it, it, it blocks through. the projections. So I'm just going to kind of blow this out of the way. Let's just yeah. <laughs> so we've got the, we want to turn the mister off, we've got a ring around the edge of the cold and you can just see it. I see. That painted around there, that's it. So that's basically an airline and that airline's got lots of little holes in. So at a certain point in the show we give it a trigger and it blasts air up 
and then that'll clear off all the smoke ready for when the projection starts. That's really clever, and they're things that you don't realise unless yeah, you've told yeah. us the public who are coming through this wouldn't wouldn't notice that. And, which and is also really we've cool. Got, uh, ultrasonic oscillator there. Which is the one making this lovely smoke. Yeah, it's <laughs> great because it's a it's a great <laughs> effect that doesn't need a lot of maintenance and it doesn't need filling up with smoke fluid because it just uses normal water and creates this great mist effect that hangs quite low. It's a bit denser than kind of your smoke fluid so yeah. it stays at light. But it's never going to fill a room up to be able to do a gobo light effect from the lights coming through the door. We've also got an LED light in the bottom of that cauldron and we've also got a water bomb in that cauldron. So again, we thought what would be really good is breaking the bounds of reality of projection mapping with 3D physical objects, because you can get projection mapping anywhere now. So from a story point of view, one of the bit that gets the biggest laugh from parents and the biggest woe from kids is when the witch throws in her mushroom and the cat throws in their mushroom and a little bit of water props out of the cauldron. And people are like, wow, you know, in, that's that thinking about that in advance that you're going to get that reaction comes into it so we've actually got about seven different effects contained into this one unit that do very specific things to do with each individual part of the narrative the um i think it's quite interesting to know as well the water pop that tan is talking about so when the characters throw anything into the cauldron um and you get the water spraying up that's actually an air effect as well so if you look in the cauldron, there's this ring of lights, you can see. Yeah, a bit more wafting <laughs> there's, there's of the There's actually a, uh, the a smoke. nozzle in there, and that's where the air comes up, and it's just the air that blasts up, gives you that water Ah, block. right. There's so much to it, isn't there, for the, uh, for the effects? Together. Really fascinating. We've also got our fire, which has also got another ultrasonic water mist on it that, that water comes up, but it's not heated up yet, so... Uh, <laughs> oh, shall we uh, take a walk through into the next scene and go well, and have a... One of the things that uh, Magic Light would be quite happy of, if we pointed out, it's a little, uh, little Easter egg in here of the BAFTA that they won for the, uh, for the movie. They were quite happy for us to put that in there. It's all the little details, and it's a really nice scene to start the attraction. Here we go. Carry on through. Yeah. Walking through the trommel just here that connects us down to the I'm next the scene. As keen as can be, is there room on the room for a dog like me? Explain a little bit about this room then, in terms of the effects, and it says about bouncing and things on the floor and all that sort of stuff. So, just a little bit about the room and, and how this was put together, really. Well, again, um, when, when we looked at the narrative for the attraction and we wanted to have people have a fun in here from a creative side, it was really important that you went from the first room, you went on your journey with the witch, and then you landed in a totally unique world. Every world in this attraction is treated differently. They've got different smells in each room. You've got, the, you've got, the, you've got the, the different room with the sunshine and then the swamp. And we wanted people to go on that journey split up with the transition corridor. So all the ceiling in here has been done with, with, with the leaves on it. All of the, the dog's been created as an animatronic figure because he's 3D and kids connect with 3D much better. All of the music and the audio, which I'll talk about later, all comes in, into play with it. Um, from an activity point of view, we wanted children and adults to play together. It's really important to us. So we wanted to engage a large group of people to stay together, to have fun together before they move on and start to experience the attraction on their own. So this room was really important on how to set the scene on how every other room was going to work from an attraction from a narrative point of view. We've got a number, obviously, of different animatronics in the dog itself. Um, if you remove all the fiberglass off it, you can see all the mechanisms inside. Um, but basically, the way we did it is we split it out, so we had almost the robotics, view, like the animatronics, made by one company. And then that was sent off to a the theming specialist, who then made the shell, and made that up. So it's, it's a kind of a, it's sent back and forth. Over quite, the quite a long process, and that's something what a lot of people on, on the channel might not understand. They might yeah. think that something like that had been made at one company, and then it would be sent to the park. Yeah. But there's a long process behind even one animatronic which is is fascinating yeah, really looking at pulling the program together at the construction stage we've really got to make sure we've allowed that time for the back and forth uh, and make sure we get the site safely as well obviously and from a health and safety point of view when you're away from your fences there's certain laws and regulations that you have to do to make sure that guests can't get near him they can't touch him um, and there's lots of different safety mechanisms around that if they did try to he completely shuts off and, it, and again, that's really important to operate that everyone stays safe. Um, for every single fence you'll see in here, the distance between here, you know, it, you, can't, you can't get to it. Yeah. As soon as someone starts to be seen doing this on the CCTV, then it gets cut. 
<laughs> out. And um, what he's safe is, is a big thing. And it's also why he's so big. Yeah. You come in the room and he's got presence because of how far away he is back. So all of those dimensions and all of those sizes, including the tree, including the log, everything has to be thought about. So when you come in this room, you go, yeah, I believe that's real. Really interesting, isn't it? We'll continue to walk down through this way, shall we? And, uh, interesting if and carry on. on um, the tree itself, where the, the hat drops down, well, that's actually an interesting pneumatic effect. So there's an air control panel within this room here. So it's a small access panel that our engineering team can get into there. And then there's wires that go down. So the air effect pulls those wires up and down, which is what then moves the hat up and down. There's just so much to things, isn't it? Like for, for people walking through here, myself included, who's experienced yeah. with going through these attractions, you just think, it's there, it's part of it, but it's all the workings behind it. Um, so yeah, and that's all behind the wall just here and all hidden away. Uh, but yeah, it's a really nice room. I think the detailing in here is fantastic. And uh, the fact that it's a nice use of, with the vinyls on the wall, but also with the props in front of it. I think it adds a nice layer to it, um, which I really do like. Yeah, what we didn't want to do was just have a flat wall, because it just, just doesn't create that immersive environment. So you build it up in the layers. That's all. Yeah, absolutely. And even when you come to a wall like this, which is functional, because you know, you can't have any 3D theming on here because people will just pull it off the wall. The, the, the solution you could just do is just have a flat wall. Just a flat wall that's just a single vinyl. But actually, no, what you can do is you can lay it to create some depth and some shadows. So flat wall with vinyl, and then just bring it off with another layer here, and bring it off with another layer here. On the eye, everyone's focusing there. But as you walk through, you kind of look at that and go, it's nice, there's a bit of 3D, and there's a bit of depth, and you can see all the, how the, the leaves are coming through the trees and how it actually how it actually waterfalls down the front. When you're walking through quickly, it fits in with everything else that's going on. And we use tricks like that more and more now to make to, to good ways of using money while spending the majority on our big pieces. But you can't forget the little bits as well. And with our corridors, with all the with all the swirls, with the fiber optic lights in there, it's a nice way of doing it rather than just a dark corridor that takes one from scene to scene. Definitely, we'll take a walk down through this one just here. As Andy was saying, all the these on the side looks very nice. Like you say, it could have just been a, a bland, empty corridor, but the fact you've got all these lights on the side really does make it lots to look at. The lighting's really cool throughout the whole attraction, though, and it's the same with the Gruffalo River Ride Adventure. All the lighting and and, and lighting up the bits that you really want the the guests to see. I mean, about about the lighting as well. When when, when you, you do take a look at it, where we've chosen the yellow colours for this room, whereas the other room was was sort of blue or blues. But we've also got white lights that are highlights and certain items for you to pay attention to. People are going to pay attention to her anyway because she's a moving animatronic. But actually, you want to come in the room and see her go wow, settle into the room. Oh, this is quite odd. We're searching for the witch's bow, and everyone settles down again in, in the room before she introduces it to tell you actually what you are going to do. As we were doing this project, there was a few creative <laughs> decisions, hurdles that we had to make. Obviously, with Hocus Pocus, it was an old building. So the drawings that we had of what was behind the original Focus Focus sets didn't really exist. Yeah. We didn't know everything that was hidden. No. Yeah. <laughs> we found a few surprises. It's a surprise along the way. Yeah. So there was a beautiful fireplace here. But it still is a beautiful it, fireplace. It is still yeah. a beautiful oh, okay. fireplace. If we didn't take it out, it's still in there and it's behind it. And it's actually behind this bush. That we <laughs> this put there. So you can, not originally there, so was it? Yeah, you, you can see where we blocked it out. Ah, okay. Back, yeah. and it goes back to the wall. So this bush <laughs> wasn't originally designed in. But I was, I was, there was a bit of a problem that we've got a safety zone for an animatronic that we have to do. We've got to fit wheelchairs into the attraction behind all the bushes and the theming. The solution that we would, people would normally do is they would take a wall from here and go straight up. Yeah, and right sort here. of build out around it. The room's quite tight already. It already is quite tight and I wanted to just, even just this little bit of room here to have a bit more of a ceiling height to go up because we're, in a, we're, in a, we're supposed to be in a meadow. Meadows are quite vast. So we use the lighting and the theming and the, the, the positions, trees, the foliage coming out and everything else to create that illusion of depth yeah. while not having flat walls and graphics on. And that's and it certainly works because you can't tell there's a fireplace there. So. <laughs> yeah. 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 The thing was, if you imagine that fireplace is sort of this wide, if we, what we'd end up doing is if you add that there, you've then got no space for a wheelchair user to come through the attraction. Yeah. One of the things we were so important to us was making it accessible for all. So we have widened up, um, but we did have to kind of move the position of these hay bales around. 
because they were more side by side. Yeah. Than round. Um, but actually, it makes the flow of the room work. Yeah, we had about four minutes. Yeah, yeah. And, and when it comes to designing uh, rooms and what's going on, yes, this is a this is a traditional game where you put your hands in holes and there's, there's, there's different things happen. But in this one, we added sound effects in it when you put your hand in, and this one here should hopefully. Oh, well, there we are. <laughs> it's got a nice, a, a nice little shock. It's fine because that's the great thing about attractions. Yes, this is room and a room narrative, and it's a storyline. But it's still technically a fun house. Mm. We don't want to take that away. So using those old gags, which you're going to see a few more in this attraction of that, kids put their dad puts his hand in there. And goes, oh! <laughs> the whole family have that. Have a bit of a laugh, yeah. That attraction, and you, you know, you, you, you were scared by the hay bale, you know, and it's 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 creating those memories. That's why I do what I do, and I know that's what yeah. we're doing as well. In terms of again how this works, there are air effects in the attraction are supplied from the same compressor, which is located okay around the back. Um, so there's airlines running all across the ceilings because we've hidden them obviously we, we really thought it was really important to do all the ceilings just again to make it feel like you're actually in the book rather than being in a shed or in, a, in an old building um, so this is the, all our effects have got local air compressors again this one is actually hidden just in this wall here all right. the, the hay bales are hollow so it's inside that ah, that's you interesting. take the panel off and you can go in and you can get to it for maintenance etc um, we have to make sure because when you put your hands it doesn't go on for too long because otherwise our compressor runs out of air. So it's all a little bit of balance between the attraction and making sure we've got the right flows where we need them. Awesome. Yeah, fascinating stuff, aren't it? There's so much to it, there really is, and it's great to be able to walk through here with the, the people that designed this to, to really get an insight to it. And, and for her as well, I mean, she's really, she's the most complex amateur that we have in here because of the size, and we wanted her to stand out and have presence in this room. So she's got six movements in her, she can tilt forward and back, and her head goes left and right, her mouth opens and closes, and also her wings come out. What I do have is I've got a video of her without her things on of moving and I'll make sure you get that for your video so your, your, your fans can actually see yeah definitely we'll like insert that in but for an access point of view on her we've got a gate here to get in and that whole front of the tree slides off there so we can get to her mech that's below there um, so much to it and, and you can't tell that that would slide forward at all it's just so well designed isn't it that, that yeah. you wouldn't be able to tell what we made at sure all. Um, when we're making it is you can see the join lines down here basically follows the line of the bark the yeah. shape. what I didn't want to do was have a big square box that yeah sort of in the middle of it Yeah. it's just nice tricks like that that just give us the access we need without kind of taking away from the feeling but those things are designed that you have to specify because the people that you work with, engineers and whatnot, they, they, they're not creative, they don't think that. They go, I need an access panel, shoot, shoot in, and then they worry about it later. So from a creative yeah. point of view, you've got to say, actually, I want it to look like this. Yeah, that's understandable. Really good. Let's uh, carry on walking through. <laughs> So this is my personal favourite scene in this attraction. Mine too. Um, yeah, I really like it. There's just so much going on around, uh, interactives as well, obviously the animatronics at the side. I just feel like it's 100% immersive. Like, I just really like this room a lot. So we've got a lot going on in here. Tell us a bit about it. So design point of view, we wanted people to feel like they're in a new world again and now we're in a swamp so the smells come into it in the way that it looks. One thing you've got to look at as a, as a set designer is everything has been considered. Health and safety for him, because he is a working animatronic in which Michelle will probably talk about in a moment. But from a shape and a height point of view, you've got to imagine this is for like three or four year old kids. So it's not uncommon for us as designers to actually use VR headsets or walk around the attraction kind of you know, on your knees like this to go around to actually see what they're seeing. So the actual height of this fence line here was thought about from a four year old who's here and at that awkward age where they're here that they've still got the sight line up to people or they can bend down and see from there. But also so adults can enjoy it with their family. They're up here. So they can see over their heads and their sight lines. And really on a floor you've got to pay for this theming to get him up there to, to make it in. We could have saved money if we put him down there. If we put him down there, you've alienated that entire part of the audience. You've also ruined your scene from a set design point of view, that it fills up all the spaces. Because if he's down there, what do you put behind him? You've got a flat wall. Yeah. And because he's an animatronic, he's got safety distance away from him. So you can only fit there. But then we've got wheelchair access on a game that's actually quite physical. And again, it's got those air sprays on it for that 
haunted house, <laughs> fairground, <laughs> fun, when someone hits that one and it burps funny that moment. <laughs> What I will do, so with this one in particular, his um, whole head has come off, so what we can do is we can ease off the attraction, so it's not going to get my fingers stuck. Yeah. Um, but then I can show you some of the mech behind him, so we'll do that a bit later on. That'd be great. Um, but also, on this frog as well, his mouth, mouth opens when you find the wand, and um, so all of these rock works. They basically slide out, so you can get the actors in behind. So again, just thinking about, okay, so if it does go wrong, which inevitable mechanical items do, we can easily get in and we, we can fix it and keep this attraction looking as good as it did on day one. I just inside. love all, all that's hidden because I've been in so many attractions at parks mm. before mm. where you would see like a, a big box where maintenance have come yeah. in afterwards and, and just thought, oh, we haven't got access to this and then it's been thought of later. There's, there's a room behind this wall where you can get to all of those control panels. It just means that you can take it off show and you don't see a big, yeah, say a big white box with a button on the type thing. Mm. Um, but one of the things we did have a lot about this is the screen here. We obviously we're putting these lovely props, which are so cute. Um, I think we love them. But then we have the issue of well actually we don't want to be able to apply robot and get to the front here. So this perspex gone, we have the best solution. We can keep it open so we can see in, we can see the swampy effects, but it is kind of the best of both worlds, we can still get people where they need to be. We can have them safe. And I think I think it's okay because of how minimalist it is. It's not it's not you know, obvious, and you hear it's all meant to look rotten and disgusting and slimy. So it would be, we've got this fence going around here, and logically, from a narrative point of view, you would have a fence post here, it's just that these bars here are rotten and they've fallen away. So that keeps that line going around here, and then we put this extra piece of fence in here to carry on that flow of narrative. So we've got the fence, it's rotted away, it's fallen away, this panel's quite big and it's five, yeah. this one's rotted away, and then it's gone back into the fence which is more dry. And all the wood around here looks wet, of course it would rot. So it's that narrative of coming up with a creative solution of we've got an working animatronic, let's just not put a fence from here all the way to the roof. Because that's what some, some, some attractions you do, they'll put a mesh or a chain link fence across there. And it's having those conversations with everyone involved to understand what the actual creative vision of what we want to do is done. Get those people on board, have those conversations, you can have a workable solution. And I think that's the key to it, involvement. And whether you are a kid or an adult coming through this attraction, with how it's designed, you can all interact with it and everybody can see what's going on. So that's yeah. really good. One, well, of the uh, things, um, one of the things that's part of my job is I would sit and I would chair a design meeting, which is for like, external consultants, but also the general team as well. So they're the ones that look after it, they've got to be happy with it. So myself and Andy will sit down, we'll take them through the attraction, and make any tweaks required to make sure everybody meets all their requirements. So there's lots of meetings that go around in the background, but when you get it all together, everyone sees it. It's there, there really is so much to it, honestly. It's uh, incredible, it really is. We, we want everyone who comes on opening day and all the work in the year to have the same experience, so it is our responsibility to make sure it does work and it's reliable right, as well. Otherwise, we, we can put special effects in that may last a week. It's a theme park, it's not going to work, and it's not a temporary attraction. 100%. Well, uh, should we continue to walk through? Really do love this lighting effect as we walk down towards the dragon. I think Andy's round here somewhere. Ah! Here he is. Yeah, <laughs> little jump scare. Right? <laughs> but, oh, that's my wish. So, when we did this attraction, um, the reason that's going off is <laughs> kind of sense. Going to talk about why that room's been designed in that way in a second. But this guy here, there was a lot of concern about him being too scary for the audience and the children. But like, like any attraction. Um, why I got into theme park design was it gave me confidence as a child going through these that I did it and had those memories with my parents. Um, the way that we've scripted the attraction, just like we did with the Gruffalo, is this attraction's got a heartbeat as much as the Gruffalo has. It gets dark, it gets light, it gets dark, it gets light, it gets dark, it gets light. All the kids are having so much fun right now, they see him and he's presented in quite a light way and he's actually a fun character to have. We have no problems here. Um, and, that, and, that, and that's really important as an attraction designer, you don't, you don't, you, you don't, you're not, you, you don't, you, you not, don't do a traitorous action in your horror attraction to your customers that are in here. You set the attraction up from the beginning, you can't put a jump scare where he would be in complete darkness and a kid gets right next to him and a strobe light goes off at him and scream. Because we haven't set any of that up beforehand. 
So when you do get something that could be seen as a little bit scary, look at the rest of your attraction, how it fits in, and put beautiful lighting effects in to go, he's safe to approach, it's okay, but he's a little bit scary, and have some, then you can use a smoke machine that comes out of his mouth to add a little bit of scare to him. And it was the same with the Gruffalo when we met the Gruffalo. We went from that very dark, almost pitch black snake scene to meet the giant Gruffalo who's very well lit and he's laughing. It's the same technique, same, same effect idea with, with, this with this. And it's really impressive. It's, it's, it's big scale, isn't it, as well? When you walk around, you turn the corner with the nice lighting effects and, and see him down the bottom just here. Awesome, yeah. it really is. So, we're going to go into the mirror maze now, and it's going to give me a little bit of a chance to talk about off. the music. That's <laughs> my wish! So the music for the attraction is totally Buzz bespoke. That was my written, wish! Um, it was written by you know, John Sanderson from Pixar Production. And we launched a musical-esque soundtrack. And was off through the sky. So every single scene has been choreographed and scripted and tied to that music. Which also tells people... Hi there, that dragon's inside! It also tells you how to move through the attraction. It tells people when to stop moving. And it tells people the beat of the attraction. And if you listen to the music, which will give you some samples of, you will hear it when the show finishes. Bom, 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 bom. Time to move on, get out of the scene, more people coming. Yeah. And, and people get that rhythm and they go through it. Or the mirror maze, because it's so close to the dragon, it's got a very dramatic, almost scary soundtrack going on it. This room, which has got a very dramatic soundtrack in it, there was no way to script the audio in there. Instead, we went for turn off the music in that room. As you can hear in this room, it's got a looping sound that's waiting to be triggered. Yeah. That room in there has just got triggered audio effects that you go through, but actually in the real score, it had something that brought all the drama together. People are moving at their own pace in there, and each, each individual screen had a different bit of music done for it. But that would only work for the person at the front. The person at the back is probably going to get nothing. So the decision was to make was to make was to make that censored tripped individually for each person, and then come back into the idea and hear of the actual finale. That, that's a really good idea. Just so nobody misses out, then do they when they're walking through? And it's also impossible to to trick the attraction. If you if you've on Hocus Pocus Hall when people came in and they run through to speed run Hocus Pocus Hall, if someone tries to speed run room on the broom you're not going to trip each scene for the next guest because the trips are timed with the actual showpiece. It's impossible. If you go past one of the trip sensors on the floor and it's already in show, it's not going to restart it. And it's only going to restart the next scene once the scene before it is finished and said, OK, I'm armed now to go through. So if someone does start the dog show and halfway through the dog show runs through, trips the bird scene, trips the frog scene, they're not going to go. And that's important to make sure that everyone gets the, the, the enjoyment. So we are now in the central rack room of the attraction. So this is this is really the brains of everything that controls it. So these two main racks here, what we've got are these units there, Alcon McBride show controllers. So they're kind of seen as the creme de la creme of the show control. And what they do is they basically take all the signals for the attraction, they trigger things when they need to be triggered. Also in all of here, we've got all of um, all of the audio, so you see these Bose units. Um, so each of those media players plays different soundtracks in different rooms. Um, can't remember how many we've got off the top of my head, but there's there's probably over 24 different soundtracks in this attraction. Um, I know we've got over an hour and a half's worth of music that was composed specifically for Room on the Broom. Uh, and then we've got things like uh, these bright signs. So bright signs take all of the um, all of the video files and they play those on our screens and on our projectors. So it really kind of all comes back here, all, all cable back into here, and this is the heart. The nerve centre of Room on a Room. Absolutely, it's very glamorous in here. <laughs> there's so much to it though, isn't there? Like, it, like look at all the different uh, like bows, like amps and controls and stuff yeah. to it. So much to it for the uh, for the attraction. It's all nicely compact in, a, in the space here as well, isn't it, yeah. really? There's a lot that's been fit in. We did have to make this room slightly larger. Uh, when it was Hocus Pocus, I think the wall was probably across about here. Um, and we thought, well, we're going to fit it all in, but I'm glad we made it bigger because as you go through a project, you think, oh, we'll just add this effect here, we'll add this effect here. And it all takes its own control box and all of a sudden mm. it becomes very... And important. you've got to think of that yeah. as you go along. I think that's another yeah. thing what a lot of people might not realise. You yeah. might put in some more fancy effects, but you've got to think about the back of house yeah. side to it as well, uh, like power sources and all that sort of Absolutely, stuff. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, I mean, you can see there's quite a lot of drawings over the walls here showing cable runs. A lot of these we yeah. use during construction, but we keep them up because it's kind of a handy reference guide in case we need to do any troubleshooting. 
Um, yeah, interesting just to see yeah. like a floor plan, a bit of an overview of it, just yeah. to um, just to see how compact it all is really. Like it's surprising it actually is. that it's it's not a massive space, but because you're kind of you're walking in and out, you're going around and we really make full use of the floor area, it feels like a really large attraction, but there's there's no waste of spots in it at all. Awesome. No, really nice just to see all of that and, and just yeah. get an idea about all the uh, all the technical side behind the attraction. We've got um, so this, this box here is an example of one of our control units for uh, the anima animatronics. So this one's actually for the bird, because the bird is the other side of this wall, so that's the tree ah, where she right. sits. So this is why I threw the wall. Um, but it, it's just, it basically just provides all the signals for her to move. So there'll be a signal in there for her to turn her head, signal to flap the wings, signal to move forward and back. So what they'll do is they'll come in with um, a unit and they basically, it's a little bit like um, playing um, on an Xbox controller, they control that and that sets the movement so we can set her to the music and do exactly what we want her to do. So, so it's really fascinating yeah. Just, yeah, to, just to hear about all that stuff, it really is. But no, so a unit, if you turn around as well, this. this is the control unit for a lot of the effects in the attraction. Do you think you've got things like cauldron low levels, cauldron high levels and the pre-shown in the finale. Uh, so they, they basically, if we ever get an issue with the water in there, it will automatically stop itself filling up. Because all of the cauldrons, where we've got um, the water misters in there, that uses quite a lot of water from the cauldrons, so they automatically fill themselves up. What we don't want them to do is overfill or underfill. And if it's underfilled, it could damage the equipment if it's operating without water. If it's overfilled, we obviously got an issue with flooding. So that controls all of this. Um, and it controls things like the broom animatronic in the finale as well. So it's all linked in here got the e-stop so if we need to have a stop the attraction that could be done from here as well. Fascinating, awesome, well thanks for showing us a little look Going around the, the uh, behind the scenes stuff just here. How awesome was that to go behind the scenes of the new attraction for 2019 here at Chessington. It really makes you appreciate how much work both Andy, Michelle and everybody else involved in that project really put in to get that awesome end result. I especially loved going behind the scenes there and just seeing all the controls for it. I mean, I love all programming and DMX and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and just seeing all that set up in there is incredible. They've certainly fit a lot of back of house stuff into a very small area. Uh, you've got to bear in mind, it was a former attraction. It was Hocus Pocus Hall. And as much as the layout's the same, there's a lot more technology in there. Uh, and you can certainly tell that, you know, it's been a bit of a struggle in places to squeeze it all in, but they've managed it. It's a really nice walkthrough for all the family. And they've actually made a few changes to it since I last went in there. Uh, a bit more painting, a few changes to the sequencing with things uh, and some of the sensors uh, just to improve the experience. So yeah, it's changed it even more since when I last did it, uh, when it first opened back in March. Uh, yeah, really impressed with that. And it was great to uh, see it. However, let's go back to the winter of 2018, early 2019, when the attraction was in development. And of course, uh, Merlin Magic Making, uh, putting it all together, all the different theming items, the programming, the soundtrack. Let's go back to that and let's have a look at the storyboard now uh, that Andy's gonna kindly take us through on the computer. Uh, he's gonna explain a little bit about how he designs all the different rooms and puts it all together in a program. So uh, yeah, let's go over and have a little look at that. Right then, so we're very lucky now to be sitting down with Andy's laptop just here to have a look through some of the theme books and how it was all put together and in particular the, the frog room just here which is our personal favourite, I really like it in there and I know earlier on in the attraction you explained a bit about it so let's have a look at, at that concept and how it all uh, came together. So one of the things for your, your, view, your, your kind of viewers that are watching this, I get asked a lot about what it is I do and how I do it and how, how to get into the industry. So there's quite a lot of stuff in this little bit we'll go through where you actually start to understand a little bit more about guest flow, understanding how to design an attraction to get people through it. So this is our Meet the Fog room and this was the SketchUp model that was created for it. So a little bit of explanation on this. These are different views as, as we go in. The natural view you'd understand is right here, we just exited the bird room and we walked down the corridor and into the fog room. So we have our animatronic uh, frog from the, the movie and we've got our bullfrog on the rock and we've got all the fireflies on here. So this is just another view showing it from different angles so everyone can see every corner. This also tells the theming contractors, how many trees have I got in the area? How big's the rock work that I wanna put in? Where's all this theming going? Then we can start putting cost to all of these different items to say, okay, well, you know, this room's quite expensive now, what can we do to make it work? So one of the tricks that we did is we had a lot of 3D trees in our attraction, full round trees. Well, we cut those trees in half. Now we've just doubled the amount of trees that we've got. And we'll be very clever with the graphics on the wall and also the 3D foliage to make that tree look like it's a full tree that you're looking into the scene. So 
Then we start looking at the actual floor plans and the dimensions. This attraction was really important for us that we'd have disabled access into it, so we need to be able to get wheelchairs through. So when the guests come into this space here, how much floor space have we got so they can play the game in interactives? How, how much space is given to the animatronics? And how are our guests flowing through the attraction? So again, on SketchUp, you can design it one-to-one, -one, and if you've got your building size, you can start to put all of these different shapes into it. Then we start looking at the health and safety zones that go in for our working animatronics that we've got to meet. So we know he needs 1.2 meters to be able to operate. That one there needs a meter as long as we raise him up higher and we put perspex in front of him. And this one here needs 1.2 meters as well. So you have to come to creative solutions, like I said in the attraction, what we did. So for here, we wanted our jumping frog. So we've put perspex in front so no one can touch him. Here, we've raised up the set and we've put perspex in front of it again so it's safe and you can't touch it. Whereas this one, because of what he is, we didn't want perspex in front of him. So we've raised him up and we've also put him 1.2 meters away. When you start working on spaces, they're your parameters. Everything else you can kind of start working around into it. So when it comes to like elevations again, we look at the heights. Making a 3D model in SketchUp like you can see down there, you can see what it looked like if you were a four-year-old. You can see what it looked like if you were on a wheelchair. You can see all these different sights and views. So it's really important that you, you, you kind of learn these skills. And as you can see with this model, this is what we call a block study. Um, it's very basic, it's, it's very easy to follow, and you can see I've stepped up the theming, whereas in the actual attraction, it's all themed and looks a different way. This is enough information to be able to give to a theming design company to go, okay, we understand the heights, we understand the spaces, now let's make it like the way the theme book says it looks. So here he is, this is our frog in development. Um, this, is the, this is the mold that they, they printed out on a 3D printer. Um, it's made out of foam. Then they will take this and they will fiberglass him up. Then they will give this the fiberglass to the people that make the animatronics so they can fit all of their gear inside of him to make it work. Again, just some more information on our mud bank, of how our frog's going to sit. And also more information on how our bullfrog sits, where we've got the five frogs in the pond, we've got the mud bank with the fire supplies, we've got the perspex guard that runs around the front of it. And this is the start of how we construct the actual mud bank before we make it look like what it's meant to look like, which is the reference image up there. So this is where we've taken things from the film and looked at all the little details and the extra characters that go on there. So we've got these little bugs, uh, Frog's point to, we've got the witch and all the little ants and all these little items. So when you go through the attraction next time, look out for these little characters, because we've used quite a lot of them in there. It's those little details that make you actually feel like you're in the world. We don't want everybody to see them, but as you go around, and just like you can go in the Gruffalo where we added little bugs into the Gruffalo and we added uh, woodpeckers around the scenes and we added those wildlife elements to it to make it feel a bit more real rather than just focusing totally on the main characters. So here are fireflies that you've got to feed the bullfrog with and there's the reference images of where we took the idea from. Um, and this is our big bullfrog being made. He's the animatronic one where the one's inside of him see here, I know I've got that in front of it, but uh, you can see his mouth open there where we've got the wand and then that's with his mouth closed. And this is where we came into a bit of a problem, we couldn't actually fit the bullfrog into the scene because he was, he was, he was created too big. We want, for a health and safety point of view, it's really important to us that we keep our guests safe. So what we had to do is we had to work out how much of its legs had to be removed in order to fit him into the scene at the back and then we can theme around him. So when you actually go into room with a broom and you see him in the scene, you wouldn't even know that we, would have, we, we did that because of the way that we've dressed and set the scene up around him. These are our little frogs inside the pond being made. And this is our jumping frog behind the background. There he is waiting to go in. Um, he's behind the perspex. And this is kind of what it looked like before any of the other extra theming had been put on. But we always follow it up with some sort of concept imagery up there to say to the theming designers, this is how we want it to look. When it's actually being built on site, I'll go on there just to review the designs that they're doing to make sure it's in theme with the look and the style and also because we've done the Gruffalo ride. And the interesting thing for, for you guys actually, go on Room and the Broom, immerse yourself in the environment, then go on the Gruffalo and see the difference in scale. Room and the Broom is a very intimate attraction and it's all very small. You go on the Gruffalo, everything is absolutely massive though you feel the size of the mouth but you'll see that the style and the theme is exactly the same, but 
when I was working on Room and the Broom, I'd been working on this for months inside Room and the Broom, and I went into the Gruffalo to have a walk around for a reference image, and I just, I was taken aback of how big the Gruffalo is compared to this attraction, but they both feel very much the same universe, which is important to us. And again, we just have more drawings of when the fog's in its lowest state here, which is 890, and when he's in its extended state at 1525. This allows us to design the front of the set to make sure that when he's down, you can't see him, and when he jumps up, you can see him. I know it sounds simple, guys, but it's amazing how much detail that you can miss out of when you go through these attractions of every single light, sound, detail has been thought about when we, we come to build these things. And this is how much detail that we go into it. So if you're doing your own projects and you design a space, start to look at each individual item. How's the guests gonna see it? What are they seeing? What are they hearing? What are they smelling? And why it all fits in together? And once you've got that idea, try and put it onto paper to actually make it work. Because then you're gonna start thinking of really cool creative solutions of how to hide stuff, how to show stuff, how to have stuff on show all the time while scaring from a different direction if that's indeed what you wanna do. All right? Awesome, thank you very much. Welcome. Seeing how much work goes into the overall concepts of a theme park ride or attraction before construction's even started is absolutely incredible. And what we got to see there in the whole frog room as well uh, was just how that construction process took place from having that whole digital walkthrough and the fact that you can go through it in VR so they can uh, see exactly what it's going to be like using a VR headset. Uh, and then of course all the visuals that come with it as well and building up the different layers and walking through then different rooms, seeing if heights need adjusting. Honestly, like there's so much work that goes into it. Uh, I've been passionate about this industry for a number of years, but to actually sit down with a theme park designer uh, and see all that theme book, I'm in my element. I absolutely loved it. And uh, yeah, it was just great to see all of that. So a big thank you to Andy. However, I want to know a little bit more about Andy's work. So next, we're going to try something a bit different. We're going to go on the Gruffalo River Ride Adventure. Uh, it's a ride that opened here in 2017. It was a retheme from the former Bubble Works attraction. And uh, yeah, this was also done by Andy and Michelle. Uh, so yeah, we're going to go on here. I'm going to do a bit of a Q&A with Andy. He's very well known in the theme park industry now for a lot of work he's done, mainly across Chessington and also Gardaland as well. He was uh, responsible for Oblivion the Black Hole, uh, a B&M dive coaster that's exceptionally themed. And uh, yeah, you can see that over in our Gardaland videos on the channel um, but yes we're gonna go on here and it's about an eight minute ish ride cycle I'll check that with Andy in a minute and uh, yeah in that time I'm gonna see how many questions I can ask him about how he got into the industry a little bit about how he designs the attractions whilst we're going round on one of his attractions so yeah let's head up there and go for a ride on the Gruffalo River Ride Adventure with Andrew Porter Right then, so off we go on the Gruffalo River Ride Adventure. I've got around eight minutes to ask Andy some questions. So here we go. So who decides the initial concept when it comes to the attractions? So when it comes to designing a theme park ride, you've got to look at your USP. That's our guests. That's what they want. And we've got to look at who comes into our park, why they're here, what they want to do. And that starts the discussion. Well, when it came to the group row, it was just an obvious fit. The bubble works had come to the end of its life, and Julia Donaldson wrote these beautiful stories that had animals in it. So for Chessington, we've got animals, we've got a beautiful story in a beautiful setting. It just seemed the right thing to do. So that gets penciled around the table. And you're doing lots of concepts, we could do this, we could do this. As soon as we heard the Gruffalo, room of the room, she cried, we had to do it. So, so once yeah. you've decided the concept for the attraction, how many different stages are there and how much time is it before your plans on paper sort of come into fruition and things start to get built for the attraction? So they're normally about two year projects for something like this. And it starts with looking at the existing building, looking at what's going on within the spaces, and going, how do we fit this story in here? Well, we've got a gruff room, we've got a snake, and we're going to a very scary swamp now. And all the attraction has got heartbeats on it. Obviously, that's got to be weighed by budget, and you work with the project managers and all of the architects to come to an agreement. Okay, all of the stuff we do doesn't get in, but we make sure that the guest experience is the most important thing that we keep. 
So in terms of the smells throughout the attractions, this is something that I'm obsessed with. I love the smells. How many different ones is there on something like the Gruffalo River Ride Adventure? How many different scents? We've got six in Gruffalo. We've got, oh, it's going to test me. It's been a long time since I've done this. We've got forest. We've got swamp. We've got meadow. We've got burning peat. We've got, um, we've got uh, cinder block. We've got firewood. And we've got granny's, granny's pie. Granny's pie is for the end, obviously. <laughs> They're all the different ones. <laughs> okay, then, moving on, of course, still enjoying our ride here on the Gruffalo. Uh, in terms of the audio, then, for attraction, that's something else that we spoke a little bit about uh, earlier on in Room on a Broom. In terms of the soundtrack for this attraction, uh, how many different tr soundtracks is the? How does it all get put together? So, I'm a storyteller and I write narratives. Anyone out there who's either been on my roller coaster rides or my theme park rides or my horror rides knows I am obsessed with stories and telling them. So the Gruffalo has got about 22 different soundtracks in it. The difference is between this attraction and Room on the Broom is we are on a boat. We are going at a certain speed, and that speed is controlled by the flow of the river. So we have to look at the looping audio that tells that story. And again, as you start the attraction, all the way to the end, it gets more dramatic. We're in a movie, and that movie is telling it. It's really important. So we're getting there. We're at the lift hill now on the ride. A couple of minutes left to go. So how many more can we get in? So obviously with this attraction, and also with Room on a Broom, there were initial attractions. They were here before there were existing rides. Uh, when it comes to new rides, how many sort of different manufacturers do you get in contact with? Is it something what uh, you deal with a lot of different ones? How, is it hard to pick a certain manufacturer? Uh, all that sort of stuff, really. How is it decided who to go for for the system itself? So we've got a really good team of Merlin behind it all. And uh, I don't know how to answer this question because we're about to go down. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Here we go. We'll, uh, we'll let the, uh, the drop do its thing. suppliers but we don't start about what we can get and how we can get it we look at the guest experience a transit system like a roller coaster is just a way on a story to get you from a to b so we look at what is our story what is the guest experience what do we want them to experience so if you're a lion or if you're an elephant those ride systems are going to be two very different things so once we've gone okay well we want it to be like this these suppliers can do it and then we just start talking to them. So can we do shows? Can we do this? Can we do that? Can we have block break systems where we can have different projections? Can we have smoke? We start to get to the bottom until one supplier that goes, we can do everything that you want to do and make that happen and we go for them. There we go. I think we've got time for one more question. I'm, I'm getting a little bit wet now, a little bit soaked. But this is a bit of a one just out there to help the viewers really. I know there's a lot of people that watch these videos that have always wanted to uh, sort of know how did you get into the industry. Uh, I know on some of the scare videos and stuff that we've filmed before behind the scenes, just how did you get into designing theme park attractions very quickly. <laughs> so what you need to do is have confidence in yourself. Believe in yourself, know what you want to do. Stop writing stories. Stop editing photos. Stop putting stuff together. Stop thinking about all the different things that you can do and where you can be. Go to shows like Scarecon, go and email companies, go and do work experience for those companies. Go out there, do all your GCSEs and all your A-levels, focus it on big part design. Keep at it, keep going, put it in front of people and eventually you'll get there. Always have confidence that you are great at what you're doing. I have been told in my life being dyslexic and all the problems and learning difficulties I have, it was never going to happen for me. It happened for me just because this is what I want to do, this is who I am and I love it. And you will love it too, just believe in yourself. Perfect timing. That was something a little bit different, wasn't it? Well, there you go. Thanks, Andy, for a uh, nice, enjoyable ride there on the Gruffalo River Ride Adventure. Thank awesome. How different was that? An interview with the ride designer whilst the ride is going round in show conditions. Andy, you did a good job there. Uh, whilst we were going round, all the different sound effects and the music blasted out, and we had a little bit of a soak in there at the end, but you did well to answer those questions uh, the best that you could do. And uh, yeah, thank you very much to both Michelle and also Andy uh, for giving us this insight into how Merlin Magic Making put these attractions together. It really is incredible how much work goes in behind the scenes uh, to create the things that we all love.
love when we come out to these theme parks. So thank you to both of you. We really appreciate it. And I hope all you guys do as well uh, for Chesterton giving us this exclusive behind the scenes look just to see how much work goes in uh, to designing theme park rides and attractions. Um, so yes, a big thank you to both of them. And uh, I wish you luck with all future projects, uh, whether it's here at Chesterton, Gardaland, or wherever it may be. And I uh, look forward to following them here on Theme Park Worldwide. Up next then, it's time for the second part of the day, the second part of this video, and that is animal experiences. And I'm gonna be starting off with going on a VIP tour of the white rhinos. So normally, Zufari, riding to Africa, which is the attraction you can see all around me here, uh, is the closest that you can get to the animals here at Chessington, unless you book onto a VIP experience. And this afternoon, I'm gonna be doing a few different ones, uh, starting off with the white rhinos. I've never got up close and personal to any animals before. Don't don't really know what to expect and uh, yeah I'm really looking forward to sharing it so I'm gonna go down and meet a member of the VIP team who is gonna take me behind the scenes and get to feed I believe and, and meet uh, the white rhinos so uh, let's go not sure how to feel about this one Oh, they feel really not what I was expecting, actually. <laughs> really quite... It's hard to explain, isn't it? Like, the, the, the texture of the skin. Not, not rough, but just a bit like... Sort of leather, like, yeah. the, the way it feels. Yeah, Hello. That was something really different and it was amazing how close you could actually get to them. Uh, the fact you got to feed them, stroke them, and you get a 30 minute experience uh, where the, the guys that are taking you around are absolutely fantastic. You have someone from the VIP team and also a zookeeper with you as well. So if you've got any questions, people just you want to take photos of you and stuff with the animals, um, yeah, they are there for that, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, but yeah, it's amazing. Obviously, Zoo Far is a really good ride, but when you want to get up close and personal with the animals, that's something a little bit different, a bit more of a premium experience uh, that you can do. And talking of more animals, up next, I'm off to see the capybara, I think it's pronounced. I don't really know, to be honest, uh, but it's another 30 minute experience. And yeah, I'm gonna make my way over there now. I believe we get to stroke these and feed these, and I'm not entirely sure exactly what they are, but capybara, I think I'm saying it right. There's probably loads of zookeepers around the world laughing at me right now, but yeah, my pronunciation is bad. So uh, let's go and see what this has in store for us. Hello. <laughs> So this is oh. Annabelle. Oh. And we got oh, Alicia over here. Get it off me there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So these two are the twins and then Bibi. So yeah, this one does. Some more. There you go. That's it. Some as well. Oh, you're enjoying that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you probably know this is the largest rodent in the world. So there basically like a massive guinea pig or a massive rat oh. or rabbit. Oh, we're leaving you out over there, aren't we? <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> Here you go. Do you want some? No. There you go. Oh, they're quite cute, aren't they? They're they're quite nice, yeah. There you go. You can see them with feet as well. Yeah, give you some more. That's it. You're going to say hello to all the viewers. I'm going to wave. I don't think he's going to wave. Here we are. <laughs> Oh, give me some more of that. There you go. <laughs> What's, are you enjoying the sunshine? Enjoying the sunshine, I think. <laughs> Being fed in the sunshine, lovely. How many people do you normally have on your meeting group? As many top people. 
Oh, how cute are those? Really enjoyed that. And again, you get half an hour uh, to experience that. The zookeeper comes along if you've got any questions. And they're all so friendly and really helpful with it. Uh, that's fantastic. Of course, if you are bringing kids along on it as well, uh, they can get involved in it. Obviously, check the website uh, at Chessington for all the different restrictions and prices. Uh, but more about that at the end. Uh, but yeah, overall, really enjoyed that. But it's leading up to the big finale to my day and the finale of this video uh, because I'm about to do two different experiences, two different safaris uh, that I'm really looking forward to. Firstly, it's the African Animal Safari where we're going to get to feed the likes of zebras and all sorts of other different animals. And along with that, uh, we're then going to be having a bit of a break, I believe, and then heading back onto the truck where we're going to be doing the giraffe feeding that I am really excited for. I love giraffe. I've never actually got that close to them, never mind being able to feed them. So it's going to be a really exciting experience and you guys are going to get to share that with me here in the video so uh, going to make my way over there meet the vip team and uh, yeah coming up uh, we're going to be feeding some giraffe and also uh, some zebras and various other animals as well looking forward to this one right then so here we are on our vip truck making our way into the reserve here we are then so we've got seat belts on just down the bottom here as well we've been told that the animals are gonna come very close to us on here and in fact could potentially put the heads through here as well so we've got to sit right back and i say sit back you're not really got that far to sit back so this could get very very fun i'm sure we're gonna get some really good shots it's a perfect day for it today as well so yeah let's go for it we already spot some animals over here that have spotted us on this vip truck so let's enter the reserve here we go Hello there. I'm thinking, oh, who's this come to see me? Yeah. <laughs> really exciting. I've never done anything like this before. Really different. Like a very personal version of Zufari or Kilimanjaro safaris, if you've ever done that before at Animal Kingdom over at Walt Disney World. Like a more personal version of that. So let's go. Here we are then. So it's. Uh, it's food time for the zebras. Oh my God. <laughs> 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 they are going for it there. Wow. <laughs> oh, he wants some now. <laughs> wow. Wow. It's it is a bit of a test of strength. Oh, wow. Oh, I've oh, never been this close to a zebra before. Hello. You don't want to lose our scoop. <laughs> we want some more if you guys want another guess. Here we go, my turn to attempt this, is it? Yeah, I'm not very strong, but we'll find out. Whoa. Oh! When you said they were strong, you weren't joking, no, were you? Yeah. We got big boys. <laughs> it's making me look right weak, this is. <laughs> yeah. Oh! Oh! <laughs> oh, blimey. Sean might look like he's struggling, but honestly, the, uh, yeah. the strength. The strength of these, yeah. <laughs> I was not expecting that. I'll never look at a zebra the same again for how strong they are. That's and the, crazy. The guys have just fed are only two years old. Wow. So two years old and they're, they're that strong. Like, uh, wow. So Dare I attempt to give you this last bit? <laughs> Do you want that last bit? I'm going to attempt. <laughs> <laughs> Two years old and you're that strong, wow. <laughs> Can you see the one you're feeding now, Oberon's quite young, it's still got that Oh, that's it, face. it's all gone, it's all gone. <laughs> that's no more, you can't look at me like that, it's all, it's all gone. Yeah. <laughs> Not violent with you, yeah. <laughs> Nearly had my arm ripped off, oh, there we are. Oh, going in with it. Go. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <Wee>. <laughs> I can't believe how strong they are. Absolutely crazy. And we're so close to them as well. That's the, the beauty of these VIP experiences. You are here right next to them. Um, you know, you've only got this little bar just here, but the fact that it, it, it's so open, you know, re really good at getting up close and personal to the animals. <laughs> Hello? Oh. <laughs> Keep helping yourself with the leaves, because the leaves are just for you. Some more loads of food to give them, loads of leaves. We are. Do you want some more? There is he. He's going to poke his head round. No. Too interested in the grass down there, I think. Oh, no. There we go. Hello. Say hello to the viewers. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? You want some more? I can sort you out with some of that, pal. I'll get you some more. Yeah. 
No, oh, oh, he wanted some more, now he's gone. Yeah, the zebras aren't interested in these. These animals are much more gentle. There he is. Hello. <laughs> you hiding around there? You're gonna come around here so I can see you? Or you just want me to get you some more? You, do, you always want me to get you some more, don't you? We've got a bit of ostrich action here now. Oh, he's getting very close. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's gone now, the ostrich are here. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, what's he doing? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. There's something really satisfying Whoa. about <laughs> about that. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa, he's getting excited oh, now. Mate, ladies and gentlemen. What, what, what's this one's name? No, this is Oscar. Oscar? Oscar. I like Oscar, but he's a bit Oscar, it's really like really satisfying just how, how quick he goes in there. Oh yeah, really satisfying when you're holding on to Yeah. <laughs> It's like me when I walk into like Greg's or something that is like <laughs> grabbing a oh, sausage roll. Yeah, that's it. Look at that. You're oh. loving that, aren't you, Oscar? Whoa! Yeah. A few more. <laughs> I think we're off, Oscar. <laughs> Living the dream there. Right, Living the dream. Yeah. <laughs> you get some more space. Yeah, everyone's around. <laughs> Hi, Oscar. Oh you're no, you're just going to follow right? us. Yeah. <laughs> Going for more. Okay, Amazing to get so close to these animals. Really is. Oh, bye, Oscar. <laughs> so right here we also have a uh, tingo, which is a type of marsh antelope. Uh, they're pretty hard to spot. They're a lot smaller than the other guys we have out here. But if you can find them, the females are a gingery colour with like white spots and stuff, and the males are a dark brown. But we only have one male. Uh, I think we'll go past them when we go through here to see the cows. Uh, hey, the small hey. one is Eden, she's a bit more friendly, and the big boyfriend behind her is a Prolix. So we can feed these guys. They have the grass pellet like the zebras. Okay. How, how strong are these? Are these going to try and rip, rip it off me? <laughs> I'm going to find out. Oh no, here we go. Yeah, This is a bit scary, this. You can do this one, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try and sit back as far as I can. <coughs> and Oh. 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 Oh my god, oh, let me get the basket out. Oh. <laughs> it's not going too well. Hang on, that's it. Whoa! Oh my god! <laughs> they are strong. That is absolutely crazy. Yeah, and just like that, it has gone. Yeah, I can imagine it's not great holding the camera and doing it, but there we go, I've attempted. You're right, you can get it from the floor. Oh wow. That's amazing. Yeah. See you soon. Goodbye. Whoa, let's watch that massive horn then. <laughs> they are absolutely huge. Look at the size of that. <laughs> I'll see you doing at the back. He's trying to push us along. Yeah. <laughs> it's just amazing to get so close. Really recommend it for how close you can get to them here. It's one thing being on something like Zufari and seeing them in the distance, but with this, the fact that you, you're right up against them, brilliant. Really good way to appreciate these wonderful animals. It's food time. Afternoon feed for the animals here at Chessington. Whoa! <laughs> and out comes the food. I mean, chased by animals. <laughs> That's their afternoon feed. Bumpy ride, but I'm really enjoying it. It's amazing so far. Really good. Here's a beautiful shot of all the animals there together with the backdrop there of the two different hotels here at Chessington as well. Obviously, if you're staying in the rooms up there, you get a great view out over the reserve. I've stayed there a couple of times before in the past. Really recommend it. It's nothing quite like waking up on the morning and, and looking out and seeing the animals. Right then, so we had a little bit of a 10 minute breather and we're back in the truck and we've had this attached onto the side now. You can see all different nettles and plants and things that have been put into that. Very bumpy. <laughs> As you can see, that's been attached onto the side now. As we make our way to go and feed the giraffe. And this is put on the side so it attracts them over to us. Bumpy, bumpy, really. So yeah, we're in the same area as where 
you far he runs around now. However, we're gonna get much closer and a much more personal experience from being in this truck. And this is gonna sound really stupid how I'm talking because we're bouncing up and down. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, look at the size of their tongs. Oh, wow. Hello. Oh, wow. Oh, this is amazing. <laughs> look at the size of that tongue. 45 centimeters tongue. That is amazing. This gives you a good idea on the size of these when you actually sat right next to them. Absolutely 16 crazy. And a half foot tall. 16 and a half foot tall. We're just going to see a head emerge now. <laughs> Where is it? Oh, here he is. Oh, hello. Yeah. <laughs> Loving that there. Wow. Such beautiful animals. It's great to be able to see them so close. I say that, I say see the bottom of them. They're that tall, amazing. Just so graceful. So there's the Zufari truck over that side. Obviously that follows a set path. With this you get to go a bit of off-roading, so to speak. You get much closer. The fact that you've got <laughs> this on the side here. They're running out on the side here, so that means that, oh, straight in with that there. Oh, they are absolutely gorgeous. Oh. I can't believe the size of the tongue, that's amazing. Someone said that's why you see them. Um... <laughs> that's some more. There you go. <laughs> Incoming. Oh, it's a tongue. <laughs> in the flat of your hand, you'll be able to kind of feel more of this slobber. Um, I don't want to do. Positive do, do I want to feel any of the slobber? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Here we are. Oh, that's a nice big bit for you there. Shaka boys on my side. Yeah. <laughs> Napoli coming around. A bit more tree for you. Napoli can be quite like. Oh, hello. Oh. You're yeah, very pretty. You want some of this for you? Whoa, you licked me again. Yeah, you want some more? This is an absolutely awesome experience. Really recommend getting down here to Chessington and coming and getting this close to the animals. It's absolutely incredible. Look at this, there's a giraffe right behind me. Amazing. You feed them, get so close to them and uh, yeah, really, really good. What an amazing animal experience. That was absolutely wonderful. I'm not normally a massive animal person, but getting up close and personal to all of those different animals was amazing. The overall experience of it, it was great. Two different safaris there. The first one being the African animal safari. That's when we saw the Ankol cattle, I think they were called, with the massive horns. Along with that as well, we got to feed the zebras, uh, see the ostriches and all them different animals that just surrounded us in the truck. And then the second one being that giraffe feed. That was incredible. And both tours, uh, they have the time for you as well. It's not just a matter of they get you out there, you get to see the animals, then you come back in it takes a while to sort of experience it all and that's what I really like especially when you're paying for a VIP a premium experience you want that uh, and of course I'm very thankful of the park for inviting us down today to to do all of this for free and get to see it all um, but yeah I must say uh, out of all the experiences I've done there with the animals there's been four different ones there uh, the one that really made it for me uh, was that giraffe feed at the end there I loved that and just seeing them really close as well uh, certainly really made the experience in terms of the VIP experiences, check out the Chessington official website. There's a whole page dedicated uh, to all the different VIP experiences on offer. You can see what there is. There's all sorts there's, uh, with the gorillas, tigers, all sorts of stuff, honestly. Uh, like loads of different stuff and not just uh, your normal sort of animal meet and greets. Uh, the way you go up with a, a zookeeper or a VIP tour guide and they'll give you all that information, which really makes it for me. And especially with the tours there in the truck at the end, uh, it wasn't just the, the driver you had the driver and also an additional person in the back to give you all that information so if you have got kids with you maybe you're a family group and you're doing it and um, you haven't sort of got a shout forward to the driver they can concentrate on getting you to the best views for the best angles and things but you've got your VIP host in the back that's got all sorts of information very friendly and uh, yeah keep you up to date on exactly what's happening out on the reserve 
What a day here at Chessington World of Adventures Resort. I've loved it. We've gone behind the scenes. I must say with the zoo as well, uh, there were some sections that we walked through and it gives you a good idea of how big the back of house areas are here as well. And uh, all the zookeepers here, they do a fantastic job to keep the animals healthy and uh, of course all protected here at Chessington. I loved it. What a day it's been. Going back to the first part of the video, going behind the scenes. Uh, of course, a big thank you to Michelle and also Andy uh, for, for all of that. We really appreciate it here at Theme Park Worldwide. It's been great and hopefully we'll get to do some more with the park in the future. And of course, stay tuned here to Theme Park Worldwide. We'll be back for all the different events throughout the year at the Merlin Parks. Uh, Halloween, we'll be back here at Chessington. Uh, the same likewise we're going to Fort Park, uh, Alton Towers and of course back to Legoland at some point later this year as well. We're always covering all the different Merlin parks here on the channel. A big thank you to marketing here at Chessington, the VIP team, the zookeepers uh, and of course Merlin Magic Making for making this video possible because without any of you guys this wouldn't have been possible. It's been really kind of you to invite me down uh, for this video and uh, yeah I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Let me know if you'd like to see more stuff like this in the future down below in the video comments. Uh, you've been watching Theme Park Worldwide, I'm Sean Sandbrook and from the wonderful Chessington World Adventures Resort with some pretty epic hotels. That means it's time to cue those credits. See you all in the next video.